All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Quan from Prickly. Thanks for joining. We're going to talk about your Shark Tank journey and all else. But before we get into it, tell everyone what is Prickly. Yeah, nice to you know have a chance to meet you, Diego. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight the brand. So, Prickly, we're a natural hydration company. We make a cactus water using real prickly pear cactus, which is this incredible fruit that grows off of cactuses. Uh, a billion pounds of it are produced in uh, in the world every year, and it's this incredible ingredient that has all these electrolytes, antioxidants. It's super sustainable because it takes eighty percent less water than corn, wheat, sugar cane to grow. So. It's an incredible ingredient that has so much benefit from a, a health and wellness standpoint, from a societal standpoint, and we're just really, really, you know, honored to be able to represent and champion this ingredient in our drinks. I love it. So we were talking beforehand. You, you and your co-founder were pharmacists, which is not your usual trajectory into CPG. But tell us a little bit how you got here. What was the thing that you? What was the opportunity you saw? Did it start on the fruit side? What were you seeing in the market? And you were like, you know, maybe we can make a play. Yeah, I mean, I think. Interesting enough, I think pharmacists have always been quite entrepreneurial. In fact, Pepsi was was it originally developed by pharmacists as well oh, uh, as, as like a gut health tonic back in like eighteen ninety eight or something. Don't quote the, me on the exact date. The but, irony um, was it? Wait, was it ever healthy? Was it ever? It was, like, it, was, it was a tonic. Yeah, it was actually a, oh, a health it was a product. tonic. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And then eventually became you know one of the, the biggest companies in the world when it comes to CPG, not just not just beverage and soda. Wow. Um, so pharmacists, maybe CPG, the connection was always there, right? <laughs> uh, at least for us, like I mean, I think uh, my partner Mo and I, we've always been entrepreneurial. I mean, the, a big reason why I went to the University of Maryland was to pursue this entre- uh, entrepreneurship program they had, the Pharmapreneurship Initiative. It's just a a way that they kind of to teach students because we had so much of the skills initially to to kind of build. So health and wellness is always really, really key. Just a great opportunity there. And, and after pharmacy school, I actually, you know, moved up to Boston and that's where Mo and I met. And we kind of connected, had all these shared values of entrepreneurship, you know, and and again, just our our experiences growing up and and seeing our parents kind of how they 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 lived a very entrepreneurial life. And again, going through our experiences as pharmacists, we kind of just bonded over this idea of like building something together. And especially something within health and wellness given our backgrounds. And uh, one day, Mo actually came home with this bag of fruit that I'd never seen before. And these turned out to be prickly pears. Uh, and, and I asked him, like, what is this? And he's like, man, I, I grew up with this as a, as a kid in Lebanon. And uh, this was my childhood. Every summer, we would make these these drinks, this family recipe, out of the, the prickly pear cactus. And they called it a sober uh, at the time. And it's called a, a bunch of different names. In Mexico, it's called the tuna. And in Italy, it's called the pico d'india. Um, and it's called the prickly pear in the U.S., right? And so it's called the Sober, and he and he just juiced this this uh, this drink, and it was it was amazing because the color of the liquid was this beautiful magenta color, you know, it tasted so light and refreshing, um, and it was, it was a natural product. And so immediately we were just kind of like taken back to, this is what you grew up with as a kid, you know, that's not what we grew up with as kids. Like everything that we had as as kids was artificial, it was high in sugar, and it wasn't natural, right? And and so that immediately kind of just made us think, you know, especially being pharmacists, we had already seen how the habits that you build as a, as a young kid, they follow, follow you throughout the rest of your life, right? It's like if you grew up on artificial products, when you're stressed, when you need something, you're craving something, you're still reaching for those types of products, right? And so we just saw an opportunity to really re- redefine those habits, whether it's ones that you had built for a long time, or you were just a young family like ourselves, where we wanted to give our kids something that was natural and low sugar to begin with. Um, and so we also saw the opportunity as how do we make sure that as we brand this product in this company, that it was something as, as approachable as these other hydration products that were artificial and high in sugar. And that's how kind of Prickly started really as, as this mission for us to you know, help families build healthier, happier, more sustainable hydration habits for all occasions. You know? and, and it all started with the family recipe. All right. And so you, you guys are onto something. You have this product. You know, it's funny. We have a, a brewery here. It's a brewery in a cider house. It's called Benny Boy Brewing in LA. And they actually have a prickly pear. They call it desert champagne. Yeah. And it's, it's delicious, all natural, obviously very beautiful. I think being in California, we're a little bit lucky where we have so much agriculture here. And yeah, you're totally sure. right. It's like the forgotten fruit, but people love it. And there's what I've seen just anecdotally is like, there's a lot of people don't know what it is, you know? And so naturally they don't order it until they try it. And they're like, oh, this is actually pretty amazing. And the desert champagne name just just sounds perfect for it. All right, so you guys you guys do this, you taste it, you like it. There's a huge leap of faith as it relates to let's go create a company. And so, are you guys in in Boston at the time when you decide to start maybe playing with flavors and giving it to your friends? When does that happen? It was almost immediately, but yes, there was okay. not just leap of faith. There was a ton of naivete. You know, I think That's I think the, the truth. 
It's you have to, right? I think yeah. uh, you, that the further you get in, in CPG and beverage as well, I can't speak to other types of CPG, but especially beverage, you always hear this. You talk to other beverage founders, it's kind of just like, man, if you had you had known how challenging this was, but truthfully, <laughs> like nothing nothing isn't challenging, right? It's, it's right. all about the journey, the growth that comes with it. Um, but certainly like we didn't, you know, we at the time didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. And um, we were just really excited about this, just this product, right? And we're like, if we like it this much and it tastes this good and it's got all these health benefits and these societal benefits from just like an environmental standpoint, I mean, each prickly pear, it takes 80% less water to grow than corn, wheat, and sugarcane. And that's why like it grows in these arid conditions and probably why you see it in, in Arizona and New Mexico and California. It's a state plant of Texas. I mean, there's a reason why it's in the Southwest, um, just from an agricultural standpoint, right? And we were just like, yeah, man, if that's if this is compelling for us, it's got to be compelling for somebody else. So we started just just doing it because we were just really excited about the product, you know, and, and we were like, we really think more people would like this and enjoy this and share the same values as us. And and so I don't think we really thought too much about what that would entail that journey. And we just kind of kept going forward and, you know, one step at a time, one percent every single day. And, and here we are. And we kind of look back and we're like, wow, like no way would we have expected that. Yeah, you know, coming out of pharmacy school that one day we would end up being beverage founders and, and really pioneering this natural hydration category. When you guys first launched, where did you launch? Was it D2C or did you go into the stores directly? Amazon, what was your first step there? A lot of our learning actually kind of came from farmers markets. You know, that's so even before we launched, right? Even we were just trying to figure out what this industry looked like. Were you so, guys you in know, Boston? You were in yeah, Boston. Yeah, we were in Boston. There so was, was, a, it, there was, was a, it SOA? You were at yeah, SOA? Yeah. Man, for a guy in California, you sure know your farmers markets in the Northeast, <laughs> you know? It actually so, uh, was Soa. Soa was awesome. You know, we'd just pitch a tent, you know, uh, for the first, like, I think three years of just R&D. That's all we did. You know, we weren't even really in stores. We were just, just trying to figure out what this was, you know, and how to, how to understand this industry and, and learn everything. Because this was also during a time where D2C was booming, you know, and I think a lot of it was driving the way that American capitalism was, was moving. It was very D2C centric, even if you were a very retail predominant product like beverage. You know, there's just so much of that of that space. And so we're just trying to figure it all out and understand the industry. And then we ended up launching 2021. And and really what what got us to, to scale really quickly was in 2023, we we launched in, into Sprouts nationwide. And that pulled oh, us wow. into this national distribution that really pulled us from this like northeast sort of little uh, region that we had just kind of started the idea in to this all of a sudden, we were trying to scale this business into 400 doors and the second biggest natural retailer in the entire country, Yeah, right? And, and they had distribution all over the country. And all of a sudden, we're like, how do we scale this? And, and I think not only was that challenge just amazing, it really showed us how to win in retail. And it really just shifted our path to become so much more retail focused as a business that made a lot of sense. We're a hydration product, right? When people are, are thirsty for hydration... The first thing they do is not go on Google. The first thing they do is they go to their local grocery store and they, they, they stock up. And so it just taught us a lot about how this business worked and it really challenged us to, to stretch ourselves. And, you know, that little farmer's market test was just great to, to get us ready for that, you know, the big leagues, if you will. I love that. I actually had a company. And so we launched, I just live in Boston. And so we, we launched okay. same, similar to you. And so SOA was like our, our stomping grounds for a little while, which is hilarious. But, uh, oh man, that's such Amazing a good market. experience. And honestly, the, the data, you're so right. I think that's the thing that founders should always keep is just like, get as close to the customer as you can, get the data, always the right move. Certainly maybe a little bit painful, but always the right move. I mean, the other thing to on that though, right, is like, it, this is different. Like we're not selling a commoditized product. Like we're the, we're really innovating in this completely interesting first. white space where we're, we're taking the responsibility of educating, like you said, right? Prickly pears. How many, how many people even know what it is? We've done over a thousand, you know, activations and demos and prickly pear, our, our hero skew, you know, this flavor right here is our, is by far our, our number one seller. But how many people truly know that a prickly pear is the fruit of cactus? How many people are thinking that they're just buying a pear? Right. And so how much education needs to go into that and, and really understanding how to educate that, you know, without that customer touch point, talking to these consumers every single every single time and and realizing that it's not going to be perfect data. Right. It's going to be a lot of it's going to be intuition. A lot of it's going to be qualitative information and data to make the decision of how do you brand this thing? How do you market this thing? What's your go to market strategy? How do you even how do you even scale this? How do you package it? You know, how do you even uh, communicate the benefits and the, and the story of the, the ingredient? I mean, that it's so important to do that with your with your consumers day one. When you were doing it in SOA, so 2021, yeah. what was the thing you were realizing people were resonating with the most in terms of the story outside of the taste? Obviously, that's got to taste good. So that so check that box. But what was the thing that they the Bostonians cared the most about? 
No, I mean, I think the, the taste was, was uh, more than checking the box. It was like the, first, the thing that they were most amazed by. I think everyone was drawn to the fact that they never had it before, right? They were like, what is cactus water? Now, prior to 2021, when we were just doing that R&D discovery, so the, the SOA was like 2020, 2019, when we were just doing these in the markets. And talk about not really understanding how to market this. We were always afraid of, of owning the cactus because we were afraid of what people were going to think. Like, really, it was, you know, is it approachable? Is, is When somebody thinks of cactus, is that the first thing I think of? Like, you know, a drink? Is it, a, is, do they know what the fruit is? So we didn't really understand how to really market it. And so when we first launched the, even the test case for, for the, the sort of the pre-launch phase of, of our brand, it was called a super fruit water, right? Because oh, we're like, interesting. Okay, let's, let's, okay. Like, let's, you know, approach it from what we know about the fruit, which is, you know, electrolytes, antioxidants, vitamin C, all these health benefits that people are looking for and why we would drink it every day. Why not lean in that direction? But guess what the first question is? what is this super fruit? Where does it come from, right? And so like, you're, you're, already, you're already answering the question of like, well, it's from a cactus. And so when we, when we fully had, I would say, I would in some ways even say like, have the courage to like overcome that and say like, you know, we're going to own this. Like who cares? We're going to own this and we're going to make people side with this. We're going to make it approachable. And, we, and it's our job to make it approachable because if we can't make it approachable, how are people going to fall in love with such an incredible ingredient? How are we going to get this ingredient out into the world and, and, and just add value, right? And, and change the way that people are building their habits if, if we can't even represent it, you know, authentically uh, the way and, and, and confidently, right? And so that was our first shift. And immediately, I think that second summer we did that, you know, our, our sales at the market doubled just because of the communication gap that, that we filled, right? It was, it was never about people being afraid. Of it. People are just genuinely curious. People, I think, in society are just genuinely curious about learning and they want to learn and they want to know what's, what's good and what's trending and what's, going to change the way that they live their lives for the better. And so why not own that and provide that education and really become thought leaders in that space? And that's what we kind of did. I love that. Yeah. You got to plant your flag somewhere. At what point do you guys start thinking, all right, look, let's get on Shark Tank. Let's do the deal. Let's do it. We launched February. So we formally launched um, after all that uh, trial and error. So uh, in February of 2021, and by launch, it was like our website was up. We had DTC going, you know, our, you know, market ready branding was up and this was again in the height of D 2 C, right? Towards the the nearing nearing the the end of of where it starts to become a little bit more challenging, as you probably are aware of. But in that time, we had put up our, our first Facebook ads, and that Friday, the first Friday we launched our Facebook ads, uh, a Shark Tank producer reached out, and they're like, "Hey, like we we know it's your brand, like you guys should apply for Shark Tank." And we're just like, "This can't be real. This is just like a you know <laughs> inbox email, like in your in your in your custom forms and stuff." And uh, sure enough, we did, and it was a 15-month process from that application to when we actually aired. A lot of stuff in the middle of that, and you know, here we are, uh, a couple of years later. That 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 episode aired 2022. Um, you know, so it's been a, a big part of our story, and I think it really helped us just get on the map. And uh, we've been able to really grow a lot, even from that moment. Yeah, I love. I think the thing that's not lost on me, but maybe on your normal person or like just your average watcher is. You get a lot of good advice when you're in the tank, and I don't mm -hmm. think people understand that enough. So on your episode, Mark really sort of hammers it for you guys. He's like, yeah. why don't you talk about the sustainability piece? Yeah. You know, And it was really good advice, actually really interesting. And he, he got it quickly. And I remember when I was watching your episode, I was like, you know, that's, that's really good advice that he mm -hmm. just gave mm -hmm. you in a short time. And I really hope people understand it. As you guys were sort of prepping for it, and I love that you have your friends. People should watch the clip. I love that you have your friends wearing cactus uniforms. That's hilarious. Good Amazing friends, course. obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and so right before you guys go on the show, when you're sort of practicing your pitch, did, was there a shark you really wanted to land in particular? Like maybe one or two that you were thinking of? I know Emma Grand's there, or Emma Greed's there. She's really not in this space, not so much CPG, but definitely a legend in the game. But mm -hmm, were mm -hmm. you guys targeting somebody before you went on stage? Not necessarily, you know, I think, I think looking through, you know, all the sharks, I mean, I think there were, everyone's invested in so many different spaces. So we didn't really know what to expect. We just want to go in there authentically, you know, and as, as I said, like, you know, so much of our experience with building up prickly has been taking leadership and how to communicate the cactus, right. And, and cactus water and the prickly pear. And so even all the, all the feedback we got on, on air, it's, it, we certainly considered all that even as we went on, right? But so much of this is about understanding like what resonates, like what are consumers actually looking for? And so to your point, I mean, we were still very much going through that journey even back in 2021 because you, as you know, we launched in February 2021. First week, it was like Shark Tank and then uh, they were, we were filming. And so that, that feedback we got was so instrumental because not only did it help us just really validate some of the things that we were thinking about, 
but it did help us even more so, you know, kind of narrow in our focus. And, and, and so much of our communication is that we have to talk about all of it, but there is a hierarchy of what you communicate first. Like you said, like what are the things that consumers really, really resonate with? And even, I mean, some of the Shark Tank episode that wasn't aired was really just how much the sharks love the taste of it. And they kind of cut some of that out. But that is the first thing that when people drink prickly, they're just blown away by how good cactus water tastes, how unique it tastes, how different it tastes, and how refreshing it is. And that fundamentally, I think, is why the brand scale is because of taste alone. And I think you need that. And all this other education. Exactly. Everything else is, is education that there's a richness of education. It's just how do you distill those messages out into things that are memorable? The other part I loved about it was even Mark saying that and giving you advice in real time sort of educated the market real quick also, right? And so he's doing you a favor. He's giving you advice, but there's obviously a television and millions of people watching. And so he educated the market on your behalf in a succinct way, which I thought was, I was like, this is great. This is, there's no losing here. This is perfect. It's like, it's so perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Shark Tank is, I mean, it's so funny because the preparation of it, you're watching like every episode trying to figure out, you know, how, how, how are you going to have these conversations? And then like it becomes PTSD hearing the, the, the entry music afterwards because you just watched every single episode, you know, but going on, I think to your point, it's, it's such a great opportunity. There's always risk in things like this, right? If it doesn't go a certain way and you never know what's going to happen in the tank because it's, it's all live, right? But but I really think, you know, again, if you go in there authentically and, and you go in there with open mind, just knowing that like, look, like everyone's going to have different opinions. You're not wrong. They're not wrong. Everyone has different opinions. And, and if you can take away learnings, like you just mentioned, to help you make the business better and grow faster, why wouldn't you? It's a great opportunity, right? And, and I think that's exactly what happened for us, for sure. So Kevin goes in, he offers you a deal. It's looking like you guys are going to accept it. Everyone's out. All the sh- all the tar- yeah. all the sharks are out. Barbara's talking her smack, you know, <laughs> really. And then Kevin's yeah. Kevin's like, Barbara, you're not even in this deal. Stop right. talking, basically. Right. right. And I'm loving it. You know, the New York energy is high. And then Barbara swoops in and right. gives an offer, and you guys accept it almost immediately. And I was yeah. like, this is what a move, what a play. I mean, good for you for one renegotiating. Or trying to negotiate with Mr. Wonderful. And then unbelievable on Barbara to just go, I'll take that deal. Uh, it was down to the last shark, right? And, and Kevin was like, this is, this is my offer, take it or leave it. And um, I think for us, whenever you're back into the wall, it's just ask questions, you know? And, and that's how we op- reopened up the negotiation. I think it was just, uh, you know, because a lot of it, at the end of the day, you look at Shark Tank deals, and I think every every company that's been on it can probably attest them. These are sharky deals, right? There's a reason why you're in there, and, and <laughs> yeah. a lot of these deals don't make sense, not just for the investors, but like you know, if, if you're a, a growth business, right, a, a growth capital business, and you're a business that wants to scale and and truly make a, a dent in the industry, I mean, you're going to need capital over time. You're going to continue to fundraise, and and part of being a good partner, investor partner, is also making sure that there's space for that that growth capital to come in to scale. Right. And so that was just the first question we asked. We're just like, you know, this is uh, we understand your perspective on this. Kevin, By the way, like, pretty ballsy. Like I, like you were giving him logic. And <laughs> I don't think that he's ever made a logical deal. You know, he likes to essentially do a sharky deal. And yeah, you, yeah. you were like, you were like, look, Kevin, this is going to drown us, bro. Like we're both going to be drunk sharks at the bottom of the ocean if we move. And it was smart. I mean, really intelligent. I was also like, wow, he's. He's educating Kevin and Kevin knows he's trying to get a deal of a lifetime, but it was good on you. Good on you to like <laughs> go in. on. Yeah. It. I mean, I mean, that's, that's all you can do, right? It's like, it wouldn't have been a good deal to take. So we're just like, look, we went in there. We're saying like, if it's not a good deal, we're not going to take it. If it's a sharky deal, like we expected that deal to be exactly what it was. And, and then we, and so we went into that conversation and I, I think to your point, we definitely got some brownie points from that because once that conversation opened up, I mean, we were just going back and forth with Kevin for a while. And, you know, obviously, you know, they're, they're editing this 45 minute conversation down to about 10 minutes. But at some point in the conversation with Kevin, all you just heard was all the sharks being like, counter, 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 even though he had just been like, you know, this is my only offer. And so that's really, really kind of what I think created momentum. And, and I think, you know, maybe Barbara respected that and saw something in that. And she came back in and we were able to, you know, at least take a deal on air. And so what happened after the, everyone wants to know, right? What happens after? And I know there's a due diligence period and not all these deals get done, but what happened after with Barbara? We filmed in September. We didn't air until like May or, or, or so time frame, you know, and at that point, our, our business had pretty drastically changed and we didn't actually need the investment capital at the time. It was a line of credit. Line of credit. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were kind of like, is this, you know, we had 
we had just obtained a pretty sizable line of credit at the time too, not for equity. And so that that decision making at the time was just like, I don't know, you know, it, it, it kind of made sense for both parties actually to not kind of take that deal. So, you know, we still stay in touch with their, their office. They're tremendous supporters, um, yeah, you know, that's and awesome. great founders period. But yeah, we didn't end up, uh, you know, formalizing that offer as, as I'm sure most Shark Tank companies can attest to, unfortunately. Yeah, no, that's the reality of it. I do love yeah. that though, because it's so true. I mean, these deals do take a long time and sometimes your business uh, fundamentally changes over the course of, yeah. And so that kudos to you. Where are you guys at from a funding perspective today? Are you A round, past the A round, B yep. round? Where, where are you guys at? We just opened our seed round. You know, it's it's really exciting. You know, I think so much of the early stage of building a, a beverage business is faith in the idea, faith in the execution of the team. This is the first round that that we've raised where it's the business model that's driving. The business model is fundamentally working. You know, we've grown our sales 80% year over year. We've grown, you know, our Sprouts business 150%, our Amazon business 130% year over year. And we just launched Whole Foods, right? Uh, we were Good Housekeeping's Best uh, Snack Award winner for Best Water Alternative 2024. And so, so much of, of the playbook of what's driving success, like we know why we're winning. And I think that's why we were so excited about this seed round specifically was, you know, we know how to scale the team really efficiently. How many stores are you in now? About 1,200, I would say. Yeah, with the, the Whole Foods. Our, our very strong focus, as you can probably... You know, you alluded to earlier is Southwest U.S. It's cactus country, right? It's it's the prickly pears of state plant of Texas. It's all over Arizona. It's all over California. Not to mention, I mean, you think about the beverage industry as a whole, especially if you're if you're a, a natural product, if you're a health forward product and brand. I think it's really difficult to start a beverage company in 2024 and beyond and not start in Southwest, because not only is the beverage season longer. I mean, you're mm. think about it. I mean, how 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 much warmer is it, you know, in Southwest than let's say the Northeast where it gets cold starting now to, you know, April, right? You have some sunlight, you have some sunny days still in, in California and Arizona, et cetera. Think about how many more retailers um, are looking for natural products and health forward products that are always pushing the trend forward in the Southwest. And then think about the number of consumers are looking for those types of products too, right? So there's a lot of reasons not to mention just the the natural synergy with the cactus plant in the in the Southwest that that made, it makes a lot of sense for our brand. So we've really focused on scaling the Southwest. And then you're launching with Whole Foods or you're already in Whole Foods? We're, is, in, is, we're already in Whole Foods. We, we just asked to, to launch in the Southwest region. So we're in uh, Whole Foods in California, Nevada, and Arizona right now. And we just launched uh, Mother's Market this month and Rayleigh's as well. So really focused again, so, uh, Southern California and uh, Southwest as a whole. And your, your Amazon business, what is that totaling revenue-wise? Or at least like the percentage when, it com- when compared to percentage, the... Percentage, I'd store? say we probably do... Maybe fifteen percent. Okay, a little over fifteen percent, I'd say. Yeah, most of our business is uh, brick and mortar. You know, it's yeah, it's sure. how we think we can scale, right? Where you know, I think retail, especially during the whole D to C boom, I think there was this this like sense of that has to be the driver. I think there's certain brands, even beverage brands, you know, non alk stress or certain specialty ingredient products that functional specific functional products that work really well in in D to C, but. When it comes to hydration, which is like an everyday habit, and you're differentiating that space, like retail is the way to win. And again, that's why we're so excited about the seed round is because, you know, we cracked the code on how to win in retail, you know, and, and to be able to scale that, I think, is really of uh, utmost uh, importance for a brand like ours. Not every brand, but specifically Prickly. And are you guys still based in Boston? Uh, I'm in New York, uh, same with my okay. co-founder, but 90% of our team, I mean, everyone else is in Southwest. So yeah. our team is pretty much Southwest focused. Dude, you're gonna have to send me that deck. Really interesting. I got to try the product too. Uh, where can I get it here in California? Well, Sprouts, Whole Foods, Mothers, uh, Rayleigh's. Where are you in so- SoCal or you're in? Uh... Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. So West Hollywood. There's, Hollywood a, there's, yeah. a, there's a Whole Foods literally like really close, maybe like four yeah. blocks from me right Sprouts, now. Sprouts, Whole Foods. Absolutely. I mean, those are the places to go right now. And we'll, we'll be expanding that more and more, I think. You know, California is somewhere like, I, I don't know what the, the, the size of the GDP in California is, but it, it ranks amongst the biggest in the, in the world from a, even a country standpoint, right? So we, we've really kind of invested resources in that region. It's where we're going to be building the brand. Um, and so you'll see more and more distribution for sure as we expand in 2025 as well. I love it. Well, okay. Give, we'll wrap on this. Give people a window into what they can expect. So here we are. We're approaching Q4, 20, you know, 2024. What's on deck for next year? SKUs? What's the thing? Just doubling down on what's working? What's on the agenda? Yeah. I mean, we, I, I think, you know, obviously we have our, our hero flavor, the prickly pear. We have a strawberry flavor. We have a mango flavor. We are going to launch our first ever innovation in 2025. But more importantly, I think we're just going to take leadership in this, uh, thought leadership in this ingredient. You know, we just made a trip down to to Mexico last week to film a really, really cool PR piece that will be coming out shortly. And we really, for us, was really just a journey to 
understand our supply chain, right? And, and honor it. And so we had a chance to meet with all of these farmers and suppliers and people that have been part of this industry. I mean, for those that don't know, the prickly pear is, bit, was on, is, on, is on the flag of Mexico. Uh, a billion pounds of this fruit are grown every single year and 70% of it comes from our partners down south. 20,000 families are farming this thing. And it was just amazing to go down there and be like, man, if prickly didn't exist, like who cares, man? This industry is still going headstrong, right? And so, it, but at the same time, realizing that because of our platform, because of our distribution, because of even the families and the consumers um, that are really resonating with this brand, not just for themselves, but for their kids too. Like you don't want like, you know, families that care about health and wellness are, are giving their kids something that's natural. Like there's, there's, there's a platform that I think people are craving this kind of information. And for us to be able to champion that and take ownership of, of educating, it's just really exciting. And that's really what 2025 for us is about is just really leaning even deeper to the cactus and saying like talk about planting a flag it's like we're not just planting a flag for ourselves it's like we're just excited to see the prickly pear industry grow because we know how that can impact you know other uh, other partners in the supply chain if more and more people are just using in drinks and in products and we're just excited to be a small part of that and support that so 25 will be a lot of ownership of the of that type of you know, marketing, really focusing, going back to our roots, if you will, and and more importantly, leaning into families, leaning into health conscious consumers and really building a brand for them, you know, and servicing our customers as much as we can. So that's really what, you know, what, what's ahead for us. Well, Quan, thanks for coming on the pod. If you could, let's do a giveaway and we'll Absolutely. have one lucky listener get get a six pack or, or a 12 pack of your, yep. of the prickly. I'm going to go buy it at Whole Foods right after we wrap. Thanks for coming on the pod. Tell people where they can follow, where they can find you guys, all the good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So you can uh, follow us at Drink Prickly uh, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, favorite social media. And certainly, you know, get us if you're in the Southwest at, at Sprouts, Whole Foods, Mother's Market, uh, you know, Rayleigh's, you know, H-E-B in Texas. But if you if you guys live somewhere else, find us on Amazon, you know, just Google Prickly. And uh, appreciate the support. And thanks to everyone following on the journey. Really excited to, to keep growing this thing and promoting the, the, the cactus and all its goodness. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.